Hi, I'm Keith McCullough. Welcome back. Uh, when I started Hedgeye, this was the idea was let's show people what a hedge fund actually does. Let's start with that. That's the whole idea between hedge and the eye, the transparency of it all. If you could, you would. If you could look inside of a hedge fund, what would you see? You'd probably see some crazy guy like me. You'd probably see some crazy analysts like Jay Van Skyver and Brian McGough, who we're going to uh, bring together next. Crazy people kind of hang out with crazy people. That's why we do what we do. Uh, but again, you're going to find the components of how people make decisions. You're going to find their models. You're going to find machines in the case of the macro team. You're going to find big old Darius Dale. You're going to find a lot of different things. So again, uh, the last two uh, segments, we were talking to hedge fund managers. These guys use our team to either augment or outright uh, mimic some of our ideas in their portfolios. Because as a hedge fund manager, or as a mutual fund manager, or as a pension fund manager, you can't do all that work on your own. Which you know, especially if you want to get into long short ideas, are people with vertical expertise. So we organize those at the sector level. Uh, and then they're going to give you their views on the subsector of their sector. They're going to give you views that are long and short within that waterfront. And that's how we've uh, built the Hedge Eye team. So I'm uh, going to get into it with uh, Jay Van Skyver on industrials next here, Jay. Um, and thanks for, uh, thanks for making the time here. Absolutely. I wouldn't miss it. On the tail just... end of my, uh, you know, this is day two. You know, we're still cranking here. Uh, and today, with, you know, the topic of, of this morning's early look, as it usually is, has to do with what's going on today, uh, or at least trying to contextualize um, what's going on today within the cycle. And what I tried to do is say, is the Fed or FedEx dovish enough? I mean, FedEx has guided down two times now in three months. Stock's getting smoked. Uh, it's allegedly a cheap stock, uh, if you use the wrong numbers. Um, but w like, was this something that you were surprised by? Should this be anything that uh, anyone who has a, a level of expertise in the industrial space or the global cyclical space should be shocked by? Yeah, no, I don't think, I mean, I think we get data, high frequency data on things like air freight volumes, uh, which we have a chart of somewhere. But uh, you know, these have been decelerating, very consistent with, this, with our Hedgeye macro review. For you know a couple of quarters now, we've seen you know the sort of peak out mid-year and just decelerate. You're talking about um, you know where uh, global. Uh, fr um, uh, I think we have that, Josephine. If you look at slide uh, two and maybe Jay's deck, you know, this peaked when this peaked effect. Well, it peaked when the cycle peaked, right? Yep. And what you'll yeah, be damned. <laughs> yeah. yeah, there it is. I, uh, FTKs, you know, one of the things you'll get a lot of in a hedge fund is jargon. So freight ton kilometers, it's an international, so they use the metric, not the imperial system. And what we see is, you know, basically it decelerated into the 2016 industrial recession, right? Uh, the last time we sort of uh, were in, I guess, the bad decelerating quads. And then you see it take off from second quarter of 2016 right through, and then you see right on a dime, it inflect as we go back into quad four in, uh, well, I guess as we approach it, it's probably a little early uh, because there's a little bit more Europe, Europe and uh, Asia exposure. No. Uh, and you know, right on schedule, we see this deceleration, and then people are surprised that FedEx is missing. That's not how we, we I guess we could have shorted FedEx process-wise, I think FedEx is a pretty good business. It can, it can be cheap, it can get a lot cheaper, it's not something we're long, it's something we were long in prior cycles, yeah. and if coming out of this one, maybe we'll get long it again. It's a great business, TNT is a great acquisition, things like that. What we actually have are the industrial uh, distributors that are short on sort of that same theme. They correlate very tightly to uh, air freight, they correlate very tightly to things like inventory to sales, which we also have a chart of, which is talking about something that inflects, like if we're trying to get those inflections right, the inventory to sales ratio just inflected up, right? This is, do you, ha are you, do you have enough stuff in inventory to supply Caterpillar, to supply uh, you know, uh, Walmart or whoever it is? As soon as you see that start to go up, that means that uh, basically there's increasing slack in the economy. You do not overnight that which you already have, right? If you already have stuff in inventory, you're not going to express it. That was not a good signal going back in uh, 07, 08 when those, start, when those inventories started to ramp. Yeah, you have too much stuff. You need to get rid of it. It's deflationary. There's a lot of things that can happen when that cycle turns. It's a difficult data series, but for, some, for a company like FedEx, it's very important at those inflections. Look at that. Look at that. I mean, can I draw on that, guys? So if you look at slide uh, 13, I'm fascinated by any um, chart, obviously, that's a time series. Uh, can I draw on that or no? I so. No? Uh, well, you just have to take my word for it that in the years 2000, so inventories, Jay, as you go back to that, look at 2000. So you got the healthy kind of inventory build that people are chasing demand in 1999. Then the cycle starts to slow. Inventories are building in 2000. Then they come down, but then they build again in 2001. So again, people are constantly trying to discount or say, oh, that, that slowdown is priced in. 
It's priced in. It had to be priced in. If, if you thought that the cycle was priced in at the beginning of 2001 when stocks went up 21%, S&P went up 21% from March to May of 2001, and you, you disobeyed your process, which is rising inventories in a slowing demand is bad for a company's margins and stock price. It's just bad. It's just bad, right? <laughs> it's, it's just bad every way you cut it. <laughs> Can you tell people, like, what are, like, in your process, what are the simplest things? Because people struggle with this when it comes to industrials. They see a cheap stock price and they buy it, or they see an expensive stock price and they sell it. When we're talking about a peak earning cycle number when it looks cheap and a, and a lower trough cycle number when it looks expensive. Can you explain to people how you think about that? Sure. I mean, so one of the simplest ways to think about it is a troughing cyclical. A cyclical is one that goes up and down with the economy. When they're actually losing money, when things are really bad, sales are down, uh, that's usually when you want to buy them, and the P-E or ratio that way would be infinite. And when you see a low multiple cyclical, when Caterpillar is at like eight times, you want to kind of be alarmed by that because yep. that means they're, they're usually over-earning. And there are all kinds of ways that manifest that people, I think, forget, particularly with respect to inventory. So if, if Caterpillar dealers are stocking up on equipment, right, that means that CAT is actually overproducing. They're producing more than end market demand, which means their unit costs, since unit costs are volume sensitive, are artificially low. Mm -hmm. So which, which you always want to be particularly care of, even within a broader cycle, is are they overproducing or underproducing? Are they destocking or, or, or stuffing the channel? Uh, because when they cut production, that's when they'll also cut guidance. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's interesting. So when you look at, and, and, and there are leading and lagging indicators in this regard. I mean, go back, Josephine, go back to slide two. That's a leading indicator. I mean, literally, the global economic cycle peaked when that chart peaked uh, for FedEx. Their stock peaked to $270 a share. If, I think you have it from this morning, Josephine, the, the FedEx chart. You know, the stock went from 270 to 140 Okay, and now everybody gets bearish on the cycle in December, and then it bounces on the Fed going dovish because everything bounces when the Fed goes dovish twice. Uh, we'll have to see what they say later today. But what what the what the leading indicators really did was that they predicted uh, exactly what the cycle was doing. Yeah, I, well, the thing I find very confusing about the last couple months is that all of the data is is either decelerating or negative. I mean, we even have rail traffic uh, as a chart in here. Rail traffic is negative, like Warren Buffett's favorite, in favorite indicator. And a lot of these cyclicals are still like hanging in there. And when you ask the question, is it priced in? And you look at FedEx, there's rail traffic. I mean, you want a clearer signal? You know, uh, <laughs> like something's not good in industrial activity. I mean, we've already seen, as you guys correctly got Europe go negative. We've seen, um, clearly some issues with growth in Asia. And you know we're seeing now some issues with growth, not like hugely terrible, catastrophic 2009, but that's not good, right? That's not the- No, exactly. Like this is, this is like, sometimes I feel like, um, like I, I don't know how much simpler you could make it. If Warren Buffett, one of his best leading indicators is freight, car loads originated year over year growth, okay? And again, he thinks in year over year rate of change terms. Literally, right on the screws, the global economic cycle peaked right here. This is the first quarter of 2018. China peaked, Europe peaked, emerging markets peaked. Then the US finally peaked here. So you get a double peak, and then you get a bit of a zip here, and then whammo. Like that's off a cliff. But it's all priced in. Don't worry. It's all priced in. That's why FedEx is down. <laughs> that's why FedEx is down today. And by the way, that's why this guy Warren Buffett is not taking Becky Quick's bait and saying, <laughs> I got a bunch of stuff I'm gonna buy, elephant hunting. Uh, no, he actually said this is not a good time in the cycle to be buying. And that was unfortunately not, didn't make everybody happy. Got Becky her interview, which she always gets. Um, but it doesn't change the fact that these things are, are probably not gonna reverse because of a Chinese trade deal, are they? No, in fact, I think, I think the Chinese trade deal and anxiety about inventories and you know, pre-buying and things like that have actually created a lot of funny distortions and sort of narratives that go on in the market. But the reality is, is that regardless of what happens with the China trade deal, if, that, if we're seeing rail traffic, uh, air traffic, all these sort of uh, mostly leading or coincident indicators yes. decelerate or turn negative, what else do you need? Like, it's, it's not, nothing else you're going to really look for. Well, it's, all, it's, it's interesting. I was saying this, I was back and forth with Darius um, this morning, actually, on FedEx. I was like, can you do the back test on how the transports trade in Quad 3? Okay? And question. he's like, it's actually not as bad as you think. It's, it's still not good. Uh, not surprisingly, the transports do well in what? Quad 1, when you're accelerating out of a slowdown. So those are cyclicals. They start to take off. They outperform. Quad one is awesome for the transports. But whether, Jay, if I look at a, a chart, a trend signal on Southwest Airlines, Boeing, 
FedEx, these are all, they all have their own issues, I know. But guess what? The biggest issue Boeing had is where the stock price was before they had an issue. Okay? This was an all-time high at a globally synchronized peak in terms of demand. Um, so again, all these things, they, they, fortunately, most people don't do macro. So you're sitting here with like a, an increasing, I guess, amount of industrials that are probably going to look worse and worse as we go into the first and the second quarter, would we not? Yeah, I'm, ex I'm really interested to see how these respond in the April uh, time period because that's when we get earnings. So a lot of our catalysts are actually clustered in April and July with these earnings reports that will come out earnings. In, in that kind of decelerating environment. Because that's when you're looking at FedEx's numbers and you felt like, oh, I'm safe, it's at like 12x. And then you're looking at, as you point out, the numbers are actually moving lower. Uh, you know, cheap gets cheaper until you actually get the inflection in earnings. So there isn't really like a, a lollipop at the end for being early. <laughs> lollipop. I, like I, I have as an investor, my, you know, people know their, my urge is always to say like, oh, FedEx is down, like two standard deviations, like, oh, I'm in, you know. You're in. And you got we have to be careful. We have to be uh, willing to acknowledge, you know, that cheap can get cheaper. Well, I mean, look at uh, a chart, guys, on my deck, don't go in J's, on slide 33. This is, this is the easiest thing that I can point out to people that, um, that, that don't do macro. People, I think, generally speaking, know what industrial production growth is. So by the time you tie that to an industrial that they own in their portfolio, now they're listening. Okay? So if you think about this, I mean, look at this. This, this growth rate, which is back here, this is back at the bottom of the economic cycle. Okay? Minus 3%. Guys, how to get rid of this, yeah. this thing here. Um, see this number here? That's not a unicorn, but that's pretty, pretty god-awful. All right, this is actually a unicorn. This one over here, yeah. up 5%, is an actual identifiable unicorn. If you have not gone outside lately or walked down Greenwich Avenue and found yourself a unicorn with an app, a shopping app, uh, that would be my closest version of that, okay? 5% year over year industrial production growth, okay? That's post an industrial production acceleration based on a Chinese stimulus that the world's never seen before into his election for life. It's having Europe at a six year high in terms of a, an economic expansion that was cyclical, not secular, and it's post tax reform, okay? So that's bang, bang, bang. Those are three big things that happen. So you go from an earnings recession, an industrial recession, to the Chinese and the US stimulating the world, and here you are. For the next two quarters, Boeing has to report against that. Cat does too, so does your, so are all your, all your companies. That's the uncomparable comp. And most people, when they talk about stocks on, on old wall TV, are still talking about, oh, but the company guided me to this number after the fourth quarter. Fourth quarter. We have to go through the first quarter, the second quarter, the third quarter. And then we're going to finally have had lapped the toughest comp. So do people even know, Jay, do the companies actually know how bad their numbers could be against that 5% industrial production growth number? Yeah, co company managements are not in the business of telling you what's wrong with their business. They're in the business <laughs> of telling you, you know, people always like, you, you point out correctly that the 2 and 20 guys, they always want to say, like, I met with management last week, and I'm always kind of like, I met with a lot of managements, like, I did that. And they're really good at selling their company, because if they weren't, they wouldn't have become the CEO of, like, a big company, right? So right. I think they're very often that, that access, in, particularly in today's market, in this kind of environment, which is, as we talked about yesterday, much more factor-driven, um, a lot more inflection-driven. That's just, they're never going to tell you, like, yeah, mid quarter, our, our, our volumes are evaporating. I don't know. You know, rail traffic's down. I don't, it's probably that. You know? Yeah. They're not in the business. They're going to tell you that, oh, whatever it is, we're going to manage through it. We have a very robust and strong position and six other jargon words that, like, you know, their consultants gave them. Yeah. And they're kind of hoping that their analyst is somewhere between the ages of 35 and 25. Uh, who's not been lied to enough times or been rolled you know, multiple times in multiple cycles, by the way, you get run over uh, every cycle. This is the way that it goes because the CFO actually doesn't know. And moreover, if they did know, they're not paid to tell you how, no, how much they know about how bad it could get. Um, so uh, maybe this draws me to the one place, and uh, I'm going to open it up for questions here because we only have, um, by the way, 25 minutes with Jay, 25 minutes with Brian uh, on your favorite topic, or at least people's favorite topic when it relates to you, which is Tesla. Um, and we also have a, a natural storyteller there in yeah. terms of the company. Uh, I think we have. He's going to tell you exactly what's going on. Don't worry. <laughs> like maybe uh, I think you have one Tesla chart in here, do you? Yeah, yeah. well, it's a really good one. So this is one um, we generally don't give out. Uh, so everyone who's looking, if I wasn't pretty sure that Tesla was going to be something we're going to do less of on the institutional side in about three months, probably wouldn't include this. But uh, what we here have here. We, we, you know, we can look at air freight and get that monthly, but 
For Tesla, you only get like quarterly deliveries. So what we did is, because we have a data team at Hedgeye that's pretty amazing, Jeff Esser and those guys, uh, part of being on a great team, uh, we built data collections. We can actually see how many people are test driving Teslas by category, right? So test drive data for the, the expensive S and X, test drive data for the new uh, Model 3. So we can say like, okay, how's it going? Is there store traffic? We have some other things too. This is just one of the good ones. Um, you know, we're seeing used prices collapse. We're seeing a lot of stuff happen. But what we can see is when they they were going to close stores, demand collapse. What a surprise! They demotivated their sales force and fired them. <laughs> uh, they every time utilization would drop on the Model Three, what did the company do? It came through and actually lowered prices. Right. So we could actually basically tell when Elon Musk was going to lower prices three times this quarter. He's lowering prices three times because demand is so good. Right. Um, <laughs> We also have ways to track activity in Europe and Asia, which will help in the, um, in the first quarter, but not so much in the second. So he's got a little bit of demand to catch up with in the, uh, in the first quarter. Second quarter is really a problem. Third quarter is a bigger problem because the tax cut gets cut again. I think this is a person who's you know, uh, tweeting a lot because they're panicking because demand evaporated. And for the bulls, demand, one of the other advantages we have is we do meet with you know, the other side. Bulls were betting that demand was nearly infinite for the Tesla brand, that if they put a $35,000 car out, they could sell as many as they wanted because it's such mm. a robust brand. Data say no, right? So I think that's a place where we can say, look, the cycle's against this. Some of the factor exposures are against this going forward. Yep. And by the way, at the end of the day, it really doesn't matter what happens if they're not selling any cars mm -hmm. well, or this enough is a, cars. So this, uh, to be clear, like um, Tesla is not going to agree or disagree with this because this is not, this is actual data. Um, and how often you're running this every seven days? Yeah, so it's a constant sample. It's, I mean, the numeric is difficult to deal with, but it's easy to correlate to actual numbers. Yep. Uh, but yeah, it's not something the company is putting out. I on. could actually correlate these arrows to the, 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 the inverse of Elon's, uh, the volatility of his behavior. Yeah, the big collapse, the first initial this one collapse here? there. Yeah, that is actually the um, 420 tweet, SEC prosecution, securities fraud, believe it or not. People don't like to buy cars from people who commit securities fraud or accused, <laughs> accused of it. And then set the big drop there in October is they had to shut down everything in order to deliver cars because they don't have enough people because they did a layoff shortly before that. So we're actually just hit the October low and the April low are, 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 are it's not a double bottom. It's the beginning. You would say this is the beginning of the end. I, well, I, yeah, I mean, since we launched on this in June of 2017, thank God, at the roughly all-time high, so I've never had the mental pressure of being run over by Tesla. Uh, you know, basically, even in that first tech, it's like first half of 2019, subsidies go away. Subsidies going away kills the story. It's, uh, it's a pretty, pretty straightforward one. And really, they need, they need basically twice as much test drive activity to justify current production of Model 3s. So, they could end up actually having to cut production, which would just immediately slice through any remaining bull story. Mm. I mean, that's, that's, I, I think that's a thing with these bulls, is that they were empowered. Think of Gerbs, the Gerbs. You know who the Gerbs is, if you don't, look them up. Um, he runs like an RAA, which is like basically, in his case, a glorified uh, broker that's just picking stocks, telling you stories. No model, no, I can guarantee you, I bet, I probably bet most of my net wealth I'd have to leave some over for the kids that, that Gerbs has never built an Excel spreadsheet accurate model on the company fully loaded with the cash flow statement flow through of Tesla. Uh, I would have to see his, uh, and he can't confirm or deny that, but you know, the, a broker is not going to actually analyze it the way that Jay's going to with his, what, 20 plus years now of experience? It's, it's not quite that, but it's, it's depressingly long. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but I mean, again, again, this is what these people are doing. They're selling you stories. Whereas I think a lot of people with the Tesla stock itself, they had it wrong for so long on what we talked about with Mark Chatton, which is they didn't realize where the company was on the S curve when they first came out with, pardon the pun, but with the you know, with the with the S model in 2013, and the very little amount of market share that he needed for that stock to work in terms of how he thinks about growth. But now he's going to see that the growth rate is decelerating and the cash flow stream is nigh, uh, or nada, however you <laughs> describe it. Um, and he's going to probably change his mind on that. I don't want to speak for him, but it's a totally uh, existential experience for the bears. I think this stock because they had it so wrong for so long. High profile people too. Uh, just completely run over. They completely disrespected the macro, the rate of change, the timing, uh, which we fortunately did not screw up. And it might, you know, you know, might get them upset that I said it that way, but I don't care. 
you know, timing matters. We, we screw lots like. of things up, just <laughs> even trying to be good at our job. Right. Like when you get the, one right. This yeah. one, if you're ever going to be right on this, Jay, it's now. It's right now. It's like it's it's been right now for a year and a half. And I mean, with a story stock like that, with that kind of momentum, what we look for is the date with reality. When you actually have to start producing and selling a mass car, that is usually when the story falls apart. Because no matter how good it is, it can't be that good. It can't be a seventy billion dollar company good, right? Uh, with selling like five cars, like it just it doesn't make sense. It's inc incredible. If you have questions for Jay, we got uh, four minutes, four or five minutes. Uh, first one: What's the correlation between industrials and commodities? Is there a trend confirmation between the two of them? From Bob. Um, so yeah, like Dr. Copper question basically. Yeah. Uh, we do track a lot of that stuff. It used to be better in the '90s, but I think with the sort of emergence of China as the huge marginal consumer of commodities, it's much more of an indication of what's going on with you know, Chinese uh, f you know, fixed asset investment. Yep. Uh, so you see like iron ore doing one thing, copper doing another, oil doing another, and it's not as straightforward as it was. And we also just have much better indicators today uh, with some of our data collection efforts. Mm -hmm. uh, Hawaiian Air, have you done the work on that? He's, he's thinking about them entering um, Southwest markets. A vacation? Uh, I, don't, I don't know whether we have anything really to say about it. I mean, it's a pretty good franchise, I think. In general, we track airfares every day, and probably Quad 3 is pretty bad for the airlines in general. OK, uh, this is a good question. Jay, can you talk about the evolution of your process as an analyst? What have you learned as you've progressed throughout your career? That's, uh, a, that's a big question. <laughs> yeah, I would say I feel I've learned a lot. I, I think you learn the most important thing is I've learned my own flaws, like where I like to go, what I like to make mistakes on. Mm -hmm. uh, number two, I think the thing I've I, in this sector that matters the most is uh, what's your market look like, right? If all the houses are old, people are going to repair houses. If all the trucks are you know, old and falling apart, people are going to replace trucks, right? Truck sales will be more robust than uh, perhaps what the market expects. So look at the, like, like in the same way Neil Howe looks at demographics yesterday, look at the fleet demographics of what you're dealing with. Yep. That's super important. Overproduction, under import production on top of that is very important. Uh, you know, so you can have a big cycle. You can have a recovery in construction activity, but you can also have a shorter term move where they're overproducing, inventories build, pricing gets cut, and the stocks get really cheap again. Yeah. So that's what we actually do. That's what we're trying to do in building products you know, in, in the fourth quarter where you see you know, valuations drop, but you have this great underlying recovery in demand, yeah. but temporary overproduction and kind of a mess. Uh, that's important. That uh, took you a long time to figure out, I'm sure. Yeah, I'm still, I'm still really just, we write every year this fish finder, we, what we learned this year, like, how was I incompetent or inadequate and how can I get better? <laughs> and that is the best process, right? You just keep figuring out what works. Yeah, that's, a, that's great. I love that. Uh, can, can Tesla, <laughs> great call on Tesla, Jay. Can this thing go to zero or what? Zero. It, it's, it's possible. He's antagonized the... Zero? Uh, they, they will need to raise capital, and he's got a lot of wealthy friends, and there are very few restrictions. You can actually be like, you know, in all kinds of legal trouble and still issue stock. Like, legally, you technically can. Yeah. Uh, it's possible that he's antagonized regulators enough that he is having difficulty. Uh, you know, he may have a side letter or side agreement with the SEC where he can't, or they won't approve a registration statement or whatever it is, technically. Uh, I think it's unlikely, as, you know, I've never technically joined the Tesla Q crowd, although... You know, we certainly are very bearish. And at the end of the day, like if it's really supposed to be valued at about 20 bucks, do you care? Like is that yeah, I mean, 20, and, zero? I mean, if you're trading the debt, you care. And by the way, the Tesla Q crowd, you know, they, they probably have Qs beside their DQ'd accounts where they basically, you know, they rode this stock to $380 a share on the short side. And they always thought it was a Q, but they got the timing wrong. So again, um, that's why you shouldn't have joined that crowd. That's a very... Uh, that's, that's the crowd of people that don't understand growth investing or growth cycle investing, which we walked through uh, with, with Mark Shatt. And I think that that's a critical discussion that we had today. Uh, me, myself, of course, learning every single day, learned a lot from that. Uh, but it also has helped with the timing of something like Tesla. Uh, just one more question, then we're going go to um, uh, go to, uh, to Brian McGough. So you can go anywhere on this, but you're probably going to know the answer. Uh, Packard, thought, where are we at in terms of the cycle with Packard, CMI? So I think CMI has a structural problem uh, over time with vertical integration and maybe electrification uh, and sort of the entry into China and emissions. In PACAR, 
I do think that you know the stronger for longer thesis is right. I think it's a really good franchise. Um, they have Brazil where they put a half billion dollars in capital. It's coming back in terms of truck sales. So they basically built finished a factory at the top of that market and just produced like two cars a day for a long time at a loss. Really? Now that's coming back. Uh, you have uh, a very robust domestic market, and they have over a year of backlog, so they can keep selling trucks. Even if you went into recession, they'd keep selling your trucks. You know, uh, and then you know Europe is sort of its own story, but they've grown market share there very nicely. So, you know, if you're going to lose in like uh, capital goods, you know, uh, metal, something or other, uh, that's probably the one you'd want to bet on. Um, you know, the, the the trucks are old in that world, so people will buy trucks. Mm -hmm. I like that. Good. All right. That's, uh, we're out of time. I could talk to you all day about this, but I can do that on my own time. Too. Perfect. Yeah. Right. It's my job. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Appreciate that. All right. Thank Stay you. with us. We got Brian McGoff's coming right in here. So I'm going to uh, not filibuster, but what, what, what I want to do with McGoff, uh, he, like all of our analysts, obviously, if they're, if they're on the team, they're fantastic at what they do. They're vertical experts. Uh, and what I want to get into with Brian is where are we in the actual retail sales cycle. So similarly to what we just showed you on industrial production growth, if you look at the retail sales cycle, what we've, we've just seen is actually retail sales have slowed materially from their cycle peak, their cycle peak being in the third, fourth quarter of last year. A lot of these, what, what Brian might affectionately call crap retailers, uh, had huge runs, by the way, because they actually had sales, overall retail sales accelerated. So it's a real important time there. Brian, I don't think there's, has there ever been this much volatility on earnings day or anything like that in your in your group? Yes, Keith, there has, <laughs> as a matter of fact. There and has. that happened in one Q of 09. Do we have that slide in here? You're looking at it right now. So it's slide three. So you can see this is, these are the percentage of stocks in retail that had a 10% move or greater on the day of an earnings report. Wow. So the volatility obviously spikes at the start of the cycle and end of the cycle. And lo and behold, on that chart, you can see how it just curves right on up, and we just <laughs> hit prior peak once again. That's bananas. That's yeah. crazy. Yeah. Now, on the uh, what I what I alluded to, just so that everybody knows what I'm talking about, on slide six, I think you have it. Um, what what do we have here? This is 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 this year over year retail sales growth? Yeah. Yeah. Right. So um, this is retail sales. These are Christian Drake's numbers, so yep. they are therefore right. Well, he's an analyst on my team. He's got to be right. He's got to huh? be right. But hey? I, I actually want to point you towards the slide on page seven which this is where I think the street is just flat out wrong. So what this shows you is the blue bar there shows retail sales by year. So over on the left hand side there, 16, 17, 18, you had uh, sales for all of retail growing 3.4, 4.8, 4.9. When e-com really started to grow in earnest and hit a point of scale, it was in 2016. Mm -hmm. So. If you look at it, you had sales growing at 3.4, good rate, but EBIT, which is the orange line, operating profit, ah. actually shrunk. Because when you go online versus in a store, you have margins that come down. It just happens at full stop. There are very few exceptions. So along comes 17. We have sales growing 4.8%, operating profit growing at 1.8. Uh, it's like, OK. So it's like not bad. Yeah. And then last year was the banner year, 4.9% growth. And guess what happened? In the best year that we've seen in a decade, <laughs> you saw operating profit down 1%. That's so, terrible. No, it's terrible. And, and it's, it's, it's all e-com. It's also like what Jay was talking about with like freight, wages. Everything is just going right on up, and retail is getting more expensive. Now I look at 2019, and this is where I just, for the life of me, I do not get it. I look at the consensus numbers over here, which you're pointing to. Yeah. So you get the streets numbers where, hey, it was a great year last year. Sales grew at 4.9. So in this year, they'll go 5%. Why not? So sales, <laughs> Why not? sales according to the street numbers, are up at plus 5. The EBIT number on that plus 5 is plus 4. So the street is looking for the best operating profit growth that, the, uh, that all of retail has seen in seven years, in a year where incrementally we're seeing more shift over to e-com versus brick and mortar. Um, and people have the aggregate retail sales number wrong. Yeah. Okay. So I look at our numbers, ours being yours and mine, um, yours on the retail sales side, um, plus 
2.5 to 3 is about where Drake is. Um, and then you take a look at the incremental costs associated with how we generate those sales. We've got operating profit for the year down 5%, oh. which is the worst year we'll have seen since 2009. Wow. So th that's where the street is off. The street's operating profit numbers are off by almost 1,000 basis points. So 1,000 basis points, for those of you that don't know, you take 400 basis points here. They think they're up 400. Four, they're 100 basis points and 1%. 400 basis points there, 500 basis points negative. The difference is 900 basis points, or as Brian just said, almost 1,000 basis points. In, in, in um, alpha generating space, if that happens, He's going to be epic this year, okay? So that, that's not just like kind of a call. That's a huge call, huge delta relative to expectations. When people say that the stock market correction is priced in, they're using numbers like this old wall number, okay? It's easy to say that a stock is cheap if you don't have a model, you run a brokerage, or you're running your mouth, okay? It's really hard to say that a stock's cheap if, if you don't have a model that's actually accurate. So Brian's been as accurate as anybody on, on names across a long time. Uh, I think you have more years than me on, under your belt, don't you? I do, as a matter of fact. <laughs> I got you by four years. Yeah. But what, so what, what beyond just these guys having, you know, they got rising labor. Yep. Uh, they have no pricing power. Zero. What else? What else? Like, why, why is it minus five? Like, why, is, that, is that a bullish the, number? The, the, <laughs> the big thing is, is this. Here's this chart, Josephine. It's on page eight. And this is, it, it could look a little convoluted here on this. It's not even showing up here. So, so what this basically is, it looks kind of messy. But there's, there's, it, it shows the incremental comp dollars that are going towards brick and mortar versus going online. So I say brick and mortar, I mean you actually go to a store and you buy something. And what people don't realize is that over the past year and a half, the big surge in retail sales which happened accrued to brick and mortar. In the worst environment going, 13%, in the best environment going, it'll grow at like 17 or 18%. It's mm -hmm. really stable. Stable. It's really, it's really <laughs> stable. It's really stable, really steady. That's my new word. Um, and it's really locked and loaded. But the big Delta is going to be your brick and mortar sales, and those have really, really climbed, really, really margin accretive. Now we mean revert, mm. and that's the really big factor that people are missing. There's a mean reversion back from brick and mortar over towards online. Now it's going to sound like a horrible quote. It's Brian says there's a shift to online. Yeah, no kidding, right? It's like. Of course, there's a shift towards online, but people don't realize that what's driven the business over the past year and a half has been the incremental shift back over to the stores, mm. and that's what's going to turn around. And that, that, if there's one factor and one factor alone, aside from just a slowing macro environment, that is it right there. It's going to kill the space. Mm -hmm. Wow. That's, and, that's, and that's still using... You know, we're using hedge eye projections that are non-recession, but decelerating growth. So again, we have quad three. What happens in quad three? All the companies that Brian covers have to pay their people more. All the companies that Howard Penny covers, all the restaurants, Mark Shatton mentioned a good short, Texas Roadhouse, they have to blowing. Okay, that's called quad three at the company level. By the way, that's how I built the model to begin with. The macro model just didn't come out of you know, this thick skull. It came out of modeling companies like Brian is modeling companies. Rate of change matters, the comps matter, where margins are going definitely matters. Um, if you were to look at like maybe, what is your best, uh, I don't know, do you want to talk top down still or do you want to talk about like your best short for that type of an environment from best, here? Best short, and this is also a quad three short too, is Target. Target, um, Target, and I know people uh, all want to be short Target because it's known as being. Doesn't kind have of, high short interest. No, it's really not that bad. I think. I, yeah. I, I think it's like six percent. I might be wrong, um, but um, Target has a thirty-two cent per share drag just by taking up wages. It has to catch up with Amazon. Well, they've already committed up to with Walmart. It's already locked and loaded. It's happening this year and it's happening next year again. Um, Target's spending a lot of money to try to compete with Walmart and with Amazon on doing same day delivery. That's a big theme this year. That's why we're short Walmart, we're short Amazon, and we're short Target. Because this is gonna be the year, you can't tell when they step on each other's toes when retail sales grow in 5%. You can tell when retail sales are growing at 2.5%. Oh yeah, um, And that's gonna really show up in gross margins And by the too. way, 2.5% is higher than the last two retail sales prints. The last two retail sales prints were 1.9 and low two. 
So again, you guys are using, because we're using, that's the macro forecast, we're not imploding the US economy. Right. We're just saying it's slowing from its cycle peak. In as much as the industrial production growth number that I just walked you through with Jay, of up five year over year is a beast, you know, retail sales was higher than that. In some months, it was up six and a half percent year over year. Okay, Show, uh, actually, you guys got that slide. I think, Josephine, if you go to slide uh, 32, maybe, in my macro deck, and then we'll come back to Brian's. Uh, this is how we roll, by the way. We, I have my deck, he has his deck, I have my analyst, he has his analyst, and we're partners, so all of our analysts get along, uh, because we paid them to. They're actually nice people, too, um, and they work their butts off. Um, but retail sales slowing, slide 32, this was it, Brian, right? I mean, this is the headline environment. I mean, retail sales post-tax reform effectively went from, and again, you, these are numbers that don't just happen. Retail sales, when the economy was bottoming, Trump gets elected right here. They go from two and a half to three and a half. Okay, I'm not saying because of Trump. Get, get over it. Uh, now we get tax reform. Q4 17, we go from three and a half to 5.7. Then we go high, the quarterly average goes even higher than that. And within that, we had a 6.4 percent month. You add up three months to get the quarterly average. Okay, we've already slowed down here to like I said, two percent. Two. All right. This is classic sine curve. You have peaked and you will roll. Again, how hard and how fast are you going to roll? Well, we'll let the data gods decide. But you are not re-accelerating from here. It's one of the easiest calls to make, Brian. Yeah. But the timing of the shorts is tough. Timing of the shorts is tough. <laughs> um, I get, look, I'm staring at my short deck right now. I have 34 names on it. Um, <laughs> You're I, kidding I, I, me. I never, no, I seriously, look, I've got, I've got like 12 best ideas, and then I got, you know, 20... Two on my bench where I'm waiting for either oh, there your, either your signal oh, or, so tar so the, way or to, the research. The way to read this, guys, is that Target, uh, so Target, you, you rank yours. This is why um, I'm infatuated with Brian McGough and his research team. I always have been. Uh, when, he, when I was his client, uh, by the way, he was at Morgan Stanley. He was at the old wall. And I was just the mucker trying to get longs and shorts right. <laughs> I, so now we got Target. So, so he ranks his ideas. So Target, you said, is number one because it it's at the top one. of the list. Yep. By the way, Brian, the, the short interest is 4.8%. Is ah, That's not a on. consensus short. No. Like Kohl's became one after you nailed it to the, to the, to the bloody wall like multiple times. Uh, so, so then the stock collapses. It becomes a consensus short. But Target is like a closet, you know, indexer's name. It's there. It's where like you know pseudo Wall Street people shop. It's it's what it is. It's pseudo Wall Street. People. <laughs> it's just a, that one I like that on the short side too. What's number two on that list? Uh, so Haynes Brands is number two on that list. And Tighty whitey. And, and this is one where we were like, all right, the stock is at twelve dollars. Went from twenty nine to twelve, and we were like, okay, maybe you want to lighten up and not get aggressive. And on that next print, it just took off. It was up, you know, twenty five percent. The stock just ripped. It's as structurally broken now as, as as it ever has been. Guess where it sells into? Target, Walmart, everyone oh, is yeah. impacted by Quad 3. Oh, tidy whitey It, it Central. also has the greatest exposure to Australia of any company in the S&P. And Australia has not had a recession in about 30 years, and they could have one now. So you got that. Um, and uh, cotton prices aren't necessarily going their way. Although, look, in the grand scheme of how, I was going to say screwed. I can't say screwed, can I? You did. All right. Um, of how in trouble they are, <laughs> um, <laughs> cotton is like way down on the list. Okay. Um, so it, it, just well, just a boatload And actually as there. a pair, because you like on the long side, you like a company that if you are, and again, it's not a natural pair. Uh, you can yeah. explain, actually it's worth explaining Gildan, the difference, because yeah. it's not like your old Gildan, the one that you used to short. To be clear, Brian McGough was the first person to short uh, Haynes when it was at the highs and called it one of his best shorts of his career. He actually said that. He'll say stuff like that. Uh, and, you know, the thing collapsed. But you also reverse from bearish to bullish on Gildan. That's right. Yeah, Gildan. So the quick skinny on Gildan is that it's almost like an industrial company that's covered by retail analysts. It's the lowest cost manufacturer of T-shirts on the planet. So if everyone thinks of a company called Lian Fung, which is this uh, Hong Kong-based company where if you want to go and have a thousand shirts made for whatever company you might run, you go to yeah. Lian Fung and they make them. Well, Gildan makes them for cheaper than anybody on the entire planet, and they just order, um, built new capacity. So it went into an investing mode. Its CapEx went up. Its SG&A went up. And now they go and they fill a billion dollars worth of new capacity. CapEx rolls over. SG&A rolls over. So pods, right? We talk in terms of pods, like mm -hmm. pod, pod one revenue is now accelerating. The company's gotten to a 4% top-line growth rate. It's going to grow closer to 12 
Um, and this is ah. like a sleepy kind of old That's company awesome. no one cares about. Operating profit has grown over 20%, and EPS is going to grow 25 to 30% for a, a stupid little company based in Canada that no one cares about because they just make T-shirts. So it's a nice, boring business, but it's not going to be a boring stock. It's been a great stock, actually. Uh, let's, um, we're going to get a bunch of questions here, Brian, because you have so many names here. Um, this is, um, well, this is probably a question more for me, but uh, how high a uh, short interest do you consider consensus? It's more, and this shouldn't shock you, it's about the rate of change and measuring and mapping the short interest. So for example, if Target's short interest doubles from 5% to 10%, by the way, a consensus would definitely be double digit short interest as a percentage of the float. Uh, but again, if you go from five to 10, that, that would be certainly a consensus is probably built on a stock market decline. Uh, but again, when, once you get into double digits as a percentage of the float, those are typically ske squeeze me or high short interest that would on a borrow fa uh, factoring basis or how we, you know, uh, Talk about factor exposures. High short interest would be a double digit uh, short interest as a percentage of the float. Um, is uh, here's a question: Is HBI the best long term short idea that you actually have? The one like and define long term like you actually have stocks that 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 you have views on that are yep. beyond three years, right? No, I, I would say the answer is no. It's not, not because Haynes Brands definitely has enterprise value. A lot of these names have got enterprise value. Retail has historically been this cash flush space where you only care about one part of the capital structure, you care about equity, um, because debt hasn't really mattered. Well, now right. these companies are levering up and levering up. Haynes Brands certainly has enterprise value, but it's just all in debt. Mm. So you could actually play both sides of that. That's I would say a name that is the best chance of being a zero, like a, a, a Sears, um, is Kohl's. Kohl's. Yeah. See, that, Kohl's. That, that's why you... You, you pee people off on this one. Because literally, people, again, it, it would have uh, peed people off when you said it. By the way, with Wild Bill Ackman on, on JCPenney, when, I think it was at 40? He's telling well, people to buy it at 40? 42. He, he 42? being Bill, not me. No, Bill. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and McGuff said, no, it's probably more of a zero. Um, yeah, and you've had, like you said, Sears has already you know, gone bankrupt. Yep. Retailers actually go bankrupt. JCPenney might be along here, by the way. There's a controversial point for you. Really? Is it on your cheats or is that um, new? No, it's not. It's, 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 it's a like bone. Gun. It's, it's like bone or bust, right? I mean, <laughs> no one cares about it, and most institutions can't touch it, but the audience we talked to here certainly can. JCPenney, this is my prediction right now. Um, it will be around in five years, and it's got a big maturity due in 2021. The consensus is like, no, they can't do it. They're going to have to close all their stores, and they're going to go away. I think JCPenney will still be here. I'm not saying I shop there. I'm not saying, not that that matters anyway about picking a stock, but I'm not saying that it'll make a lot of money. I'm not saying it'll make any money. I'm simply saying it'll still that, exist, and it'll still be disruptive. Literally the... First thing, first positive thing I've heard you say on JCPenney in, in maybe a decade? Existing. We actually, before we became partners at Hedgeye, we were at the analyst days, remember? I at, do remember at that. At that thing, in, where in Texas, someplace in Texas. Plano. Oh, God. Beautiful place. It was no wonder. Like, I got, hope no, no one's dialing in from Plano, Texas here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't think you were drinking back then, but I got yeah. totally train wrecked. After that one. <laughs> it, was, it was like such a bore. Like, it's like watching paint dry, these people in Plano, Texas. We went to whatever. Uh, uh, anyway, but um, think about it. And, and, and this is a point, because Brian and I have been doing this together for a long time, both when I used to be the client, and then when we were both on the buy side, and then we both started building Hedgeye together. You know, people, some people, genuinely hate us. You know that, right? They hate Hedgeye. Double H squared, they wouldn't mind if Brian and I got hit by five buses consecutively, and they wouldn't even bat an eye. They would enjoy it. And I mean that, this is Wall Street. Schadenfreude 101, why? CNBC puts people up on a pedestal, like Bill Ackman, to pitch you JCPenney at $42 a share, and not just once, not just twice, any time they can get advertising dollars for that. And you know what they do? They hate me for saying that because I'm right. You know, So these are the big things that have happened over the years, is that Brian has gone head to head with the perceived wisdom of the intellect or whatever the establishment, the old wall has, has pitched you. It can be Bitcoin, it can be Bill Ackman, it can be whatever. You gotta be careful with these people. They don't have the same incentives that we do, and we have the same incentives that you do. We wanna be right, and again, if we're wrong, we're gonna be held accountable to it, and thank you for letting me get that off my chest. All right? Uh, All right. <laughs> that was good. Uh, okay, uh, more questions, or actually, you know what, why don't you, what's your, um, what's your favorite long in this environment? We've had this question in a couple different ways. So my favorite long in the environment, so over what duration? Uh, quad three. 
Quad three. Next three quarters, the path of perdition for retail. Be careful. Gil, is, Gil then. Because it's, it's not really quad three name. No. It's yeah. not like... It uh, back tests well. So yeah. one, I mean, numbers just say it's safe, but my numbers on a go-forward basis are so much different than the consensus numbers. I'm just so far off. And my research call, my team has to be so wrong on this name <laughs> in order for this stock to not really, really work. Uh, just so people know, how many people are on your team? Four. Okay. He's got four people on his team modeling how, these companies all How many time. people are on your team, Keith? I'm not telling anybody. <laughs> I, I, have, I have people and I have machines. <laughs> um, Oh my, oh my Lord, here we go. Uh, there's questions about Plano, Texas. Uh, there's a lot of questions. Uh, do you follow uh, FND, Floor and Decor? F floor and Decor, um, I track it. Let's put it that way. I can't tell you what they're going to earn this year. I can't tell you if you should buy the stock or not. What's the best growth story long term? Let's define long term as the, the next three years. The best growth story, and it, I was so right and so wrong on this, it's RH, man. <laughs> I'm, I mean, this. This name, it's still, it, 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 it's going to be a $300 stock. I said it once, I'll say it again. I said, unfortunately, I said it at 29, and then I still said it at 105. And now, it completely round trip, and it's back at 135. It reports earnings next Thursday. Scares the heck well, out of me. Well, you don't like it into the it, number. No, I never do, because <laughs> it only works on the print if they annihilate numbers. And last quarter, they annihilated it. They unleashed the Kraken as far as their long-term goals. They got everybody all excited. They got ready to do a deal that never even happened. Is that going to happen in this quarter? No, it's not. We had uh, home furnishings retail sales down 0.9, 1.3, and 1.2 for November, December, January. So the quarter looks kind of squishy. So, yeah, it scares me. But, I mean, that's a name. If you see it red next Thursday or next Friday, I would just buy it with impunity. What, you know what stock I'd buy with impunity if I was back on the buy side? Because that's what you can do when you're on the buy side. All I can do is give you those little real-time alerts, right? Uh, but I will hit the button on real-time alerts. I like your Dollar Tree idea. I do, too. That, that is the bo most boring thing. But boring works in Quad 3. It and does. dollar stores work in Quad 3. Um, so, again, if you couldn't tell, I, I go to where the quads are. Then I go to the analysts and go to find what they like that works in the quadrant that I have us in. So again, uh, can you give people a quick recap on, because po people might have questions on, okay, the activists came in, now they're coming out, like what's the deal? Here? Yeah, so the punchline on this is you have Dollar Tree, which is two complete businesses. You have the Dollar Tree concept where they sell everything at a buck, which is a mistake, but that's what they do and they're very, very good at it. And then they own Family Dollar, which was a deal that they did four years ago and it's just gone south ever since they bought it, which is like a Dollar General type, Walmart-ish type retailer. So you have optionality here. You have activists who, we had an activist playbook and then activists jumped in. Yeah. So we timed that really well. Um, the stock was at about 80 bucks. What they're going to do is they're going to quote unquote break the buck. So on this core Dollar Tree concept where you walk in and you look at everything from, you know, tools to you know, stuff you wash your car with and you buy a buck here, a buck there, they're going to go higher in price point. So this happened once. There's a company in Canada called Dollarama that yep. you might recall. I go to it. They did that about a decade ago, and this was a 10-year bull stock. It was over a 10-bagger. Dollarama is awesome. Um, so they you drive transactions. Hot dogs there, you can, they put one right down by my by my lake house. There's Could a, you buy skates? Uh, no, you can buy stuff under five bucks. You yeah. know, hot dogs, milk. You know, they actually did the you know, food. You know, there's there's so the whole thing with Dollar Tree is just sell things for more than a buck. Right. Now, it's not raising prices, though. There are certain categories they can't sell them. They can't sell baby. They can't sell electronics. They can't sell a whole lot of food because they stick to... They, they've been at a dollar price point for 22 years. <laughs> I mean, inflation tends to hurt you when that's the case. You get a lot less And they're for a finally breaking out of that. And that's a really, really powerful call. The, the, the company doesn't want to do it, so they're telling the sell side, no, don't want to do it, don't want to do it. So most sell side analysts have hold or sell rate, not sell, but just like hold or neutral ratings on it because they think breaking out, they haven't done the math. It'll work. It'll work really big. And that's that cool. takes the stock from 100 to 160 bucks. Now, I asked you this, uh, I asked you this thing in, in a research meeting the other day. For those of you that don't know, every morning, 7.45, I go around the horn, J. Van Skyver, then it's McGough, then actually it's not that order, McGough goes, uh, McGoff goes after Todd Jordan, but anyway, um, I ask him. I'm like, so, okay, if they're gonna go up and sell things for more than a buck, what about the co company that's been selling things for five or below bucks? The company's called Five Below. Five Below. Right, so um, that company, I don't, do, do we have that one? In, it in is there? here, it's right here on my bench, that as well as a company called Ollie's, but Five, Five is in big trouble. Now, now granted, 
And I'm going to jump in like I heard the question you were about to ask because I'll answer the one I want to answer, <laughs> um, which, which, is, which is, so it, it, once Dollar Tree breaks that dollar price point and they go into two, three, and four, five dollars, they allowed five below to simply exist just by staying yep. at that dollar price point. So it's going to take them a couple of years to actually affect five's business, but this thing carries a 23 EBITDA multiple. So it's going to take that multiple down pretty quickly Boy. just because all of a sudden you're going to have a good competitor in your space. And I'd be really careful because that's like this little cult growth stock where they're adding square footage left and right. Be really careful on that one. Do not go long five below. You guys remember if you've been watching, and again, please watch if you want to learn more uh, and learn as I'm learning. Back to the Mark Shatton uh, growth curve, the S curve. When a company goes from a venture company to an emerging company to a maturing company, five below looks like to me on a quantitative signal on everything that you said from an industry perspective, it's at the very end of the maturation of the growth story. Yep. So it's gonna go, and you've seen this how many times, like 100% of the time, where something goes from a unit growth story at US retail mm -hmm. to growing at a lesser rate in terms of units with lesser comps becomes what? You're in growth purgatory. Yeah. I mean, it's called a value stock. <laughs> Going from growth to value stock I mean, isn't where you want to be. When I started in this business, you were, you know, I remember these, these discussions. Bed Bath & Beyond had this epic multiple. Yeah. And everybody wanted to short it, including me. And you're like, no, this is a great, this is a good story, good story. Then all of a sudden, it's like, yeah, now they're going to slow unit growth. Now it's, you know, and now, now what is Bed Bath & Beyond? Is it expensive or cheap stock? It's expensive and it trades at three times earnings. Really? <laughs> it trades at three times earnings. earnings. Oh, by the way, I got a short, you have William Sonoma on your bench, Brian. Is this a short? The company reports earnings in about two hours, three hours, <laughs> two and hours. Um, it's, it's a very balanced setup. Um, a short interest is 18.6%, oh. um, and expectations for growth for the upcoming year is for 11 cent growth on a $2.33 number. So it's. Um, it, Let's just say expectations are really, really low. Um, I just kind of wouldn't touch it. I would just wait for a better call. That's a good example of a stock. Like, again, when I was on the buy side, that was a growth stock. I owned it. Uh, yeah. It was an awesome stock that imploded. Uh, then it ripped again to the low 70s in the last year. Uh, but this thing, are they going to be able to comp the comps that they had last year to get the stock into the 70s? Um, I don't have them comp on the comp, but the street doesn't either, and that's my Oh, point. so that's the thing. Yeah, so that's right. why there's 19% short interest. Exactly. So, for example, William Sonoma's short interest for the prior question, what is a, constitutes a high short interest? That's a very uh, high short interest. Um, thesis, RH is closer to 40. Woo! Love that. If you have a high short interest and the company is going to beat, buy the stock. All right? Simple rule. Simple slide rule from the old school, the McGough mccullough combo. Maybe you call us the muckers. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody's calling Jonesy and I, uh, Daryl Jones, head of uh, research. He, he called it. The, he, they thought that, that that our nickname together. So you with the muckers? So it's a plural. <laughs> Whereas my back to my haters, the CNBC crew, they don't. They put an F in front of that, <laughs> and they say those, you know, you know, those muckers. <laughs> uh, Ulta. What do you think about Ulta? Ulta. Uh, if 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 you told me Brian make a call on it right now, I I would I would be short it. Um, it's a great company, great name. It's a decelerating unit growth story. It's what Bed Bath & Beyond was about a decade ago. A category killer with slowing unit growth, comps on the margin are slowing, e-commerce is going up, which is lower gross margin. Um, hey, why would I go, like, you know, I, I, I you may not shock you, I do use hair products. Um, I, you know, why would I go to the store to buy what I'm just going to you know replenish? It is a great store. It's a really great store. They have one in Westport I, now. I wish I could new. grab Josephine and bring her in here, and she'd be a great commercial for it. But um, it is an amazing store. They own their customer. But the point is, are they attracting a lot more customers at the rate that they need in order to still comp? And that's what I care about. But it's a great store. But again, why do I go buy the same stuff? Like, or I, I'm thinking of it like a man, obviously. Customers, or somebody who's just like only dudes, uses dude, the same. Dudes pr probably using the same hair product now that they used five years ago. Women like changing it up a little bit. Okay. And they go in and they have the prestige brands and they want to try this new and that new and that new. So and women, some men do, the, do that too. It's some totally, men do it too. But sure. it's, a, it's, it's, it's still a unit growth story. And I want people to understand the difference. You know, in retail, you have unit growth stories. They become fads. They blow up in terms of the blow up, like the multiple blows up, stock blows up to the upside. Then all of a sudden, they saturate. They start to grow at a lesser rate at the same store sale basis, and they have to cut their unit growth. There's a cycle to this. Right, and then margins peak, and then you're in trouble. So is Ulta on the wrong side of that S-curve? 
It is or not, entering it's it. not on the wrong side yet, but it is precipitously close. It's okay, okay. And you still think that RH is on the hockey sticking part of the S-curve? And I'll say that again in another five years. Uh, what are your, no last question, yeah, we're gonna take this last question. Uh, what are your, I know I would not give you this question if I knew you didn't know the answer, but since they're asking and I think you know the answer, what are your RH numbers this quarter? This quarter, this pending quarter, like, uh, do you know what your their, what you think comps will be in, in the earnings? Comps, I have I've comps up 5.5. Could they be up seven? Yes. Could they be up four? Yes. Yeah. This is a black box. Um, I'm ahead of the street. Um, I'm at three bucks. The street's at 285. So yeah, I'm I'm ahead. There's no doubt about that. Do I worry about it? Yes, I worry about it. But you've been ahead. The, the key on and this one's all about expectations. You've been way ahead. Oh yeah. This time you're just a little bit ahead. And this these guys have to beat. They do have to beat. Which means if they only beat by your number, that could be a disappointment. And the street kind of wants them to beat McGoff's number. Yeah. If that makes any sense. Oh yeah. And so does McGoff referring to himself in the first person. <laughs> uh, that happens all the time at Hedge Eye. And <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, man. Uh, it's, we should do this more often. Hopefully you had as much fun as I did.